So, a lot's happened since Christmas. I'd just come along to murder this little family and then wait for Santa Claus so that we could pit our, like, werewolf self against the great Saint Nicholas. I was getting quite sick of discovering that the things that were not supposed to be real were real, so I spend a little time these days making them unreal. I recently killed some vampires and nixies and took out a unicorn a while back. Killing these unreal things tends to be really hard, and to be honest, the fallout after doing so has been a pain to deal with, but we need to suffer in this life to make it worthwhile. Or some philosophical shit like that. Do we need to suffer? Do we? Who the fuck knows? Well, it turns out that elves and Santa are real. I know. Who knew? Your parents were actually telling the truth and then lied to you when you got older. Why would they tell you that he does not exist if he did? Is that what you ask? Well, I don't fucking know. Who do you think I am? Your therapist? Because if you do, you're properly fucked. It turns out that Santa is a, a really powerful being and that I could do sod all to stop him doing me. No, not doing me in the 15-year-old boy's sense of that term. It turns out that the glamour that he can spread controlled the crap out of us. Not something that I've had to go through before. Most glamours that have been used on us in the past have just made me feel a, a little strange, a little weird, like we liked a person, creature or something. This glamour that he did sat me, us, on our respective arses and controlled us wholly. Please go and listen to the last couple of episodes, but if not, in a simple roundup of what happened, I killed a family so that I could meet Santa. No, not the Santa Claus sanctioned pedo of the shopping mall. Ho, 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 what would this little boy want that sat on my lap? Now what's poking me from your pocket, Santa? I've got nothing in my pocket, son. Must be your belt buckle then, mustn't it? Nope. Anyway, the real Santa had then arrived at the dead family's home and he'd made me look very stupid by stopping me from doing anything. Well, that's not true. He made me sit and listen to him and, and not move. He also managed to do it to my wolf soul, which fucked Fen off no end. Oh, he had also brought um, uh, a friend in the form of a little green furry elf. No, not cute. Not cute, by the way. He was, he was called Prendo and looked like he'd cage fought with multiple raccoons at once and probably lost. Now, Saint Nick and his ugly little fuck of an elf were going to show me the true meaning of Christmas. The bastard was going to try and... Christmas carol me. He was going to try and kick the Grinch and the Scrooge out of me. This was going to be, well, it was going to be my worst nightmare. I knew the fucking story and I was not going to enjoy this. I just, I just knew it. So here I am, sat on a seat behind a, a few hairy flatulent asses. I'm naked. I'm not going to explain that because if you've listened to the podcast before, then you know why I'm naked. If you've not listened before, exercise that huge IQ of yours and think about what happens when a man suddenly turns into a giant werewolf. See, there's your answer. Easy, huh? That's why I'm naked. The beasts before us weren't the reindeer I knew. I'd hunted herds of them in the Ural Mountains. The reindeer I knew were rough, hairy bastards that survived some of the worst climatic situations the earth could throw at them. These reindeer were firstly much bigger, I mean, about the size of a horse, and were groomed and prettified. Their coats were not the shaggy heaps of their wild counterparts, but the polished fluff of the well-looked-after horse-girl pony. They shone and sparkled and had ribbons and shit. Oh, and of course, wee bells were plaited into their vedal sassoon manes. I think the beasts must have been a little magical as they did sparkle, and little lightning flashes earthed between their hooves and antlers just every now and again. Otherwise, I'd, if they weren't magical, I'd really banged my head and, and was seeing things. They were skittish and seemed to want to get on their respective way. Or maybe they could just sense that there was a giant wolf soul sitting on the bench behind them. Who knew? And also, do you really give a fuck? There were a few of the beasties, 
I, I, I couldn't move, so it was difficult to tell, but I would say there was about eight or ten. The sleigh itself was a wooden affair and had a large sack at the back. I'd seen something like it in a book as a kid. In fact, it was the sleigh of those books. It was incredibly well-crafted and beautifully varnished, and it was hard wood, and it was just beautiful, yeah. I sat on a bench. Fen and I were sitting on a leather upholstered bench at the front of the sleigh, looking over the reindeer asses with their pretty platy tails. It was more of a, a couch than a bench. It seemed that the bench was crafted, upholstered, comfortable, wonderful. Yeah, it was dead good. The leather seemed to change colour at random, which was strange. Sometimes it would be a shiny red and then would change from dark maroons and blues to greens. It was different, to say the least, and... God, I really wanted one. We were still paralysed, me and Fen, that is. As soon as I awoke, Fen was in my head telling me what had happened. Apparently, when Prendor the elf had been set upon us by Santa, he had expanded to about ten feet tall and become this massive reflection of himself. In his green-tinged, long-fingered hands, he had held a sack that had grown with him to the same scale. He then picked me up between finger and thumb, dropped me in the sack, and followed me with a, a solid statue of Fen. See, this bit is tricky to accept because nothing can normally touch Fen, my wolf saw. Weird. You see, he can walk through physical shit like walls, people and things, so the fact the elf scoots him up was strange. Although maybe Prendor did not exist in the real world, you know, in the way we think these things exist, so he could do something like that. I was confused, but not in the mood to try and ask the elf what his secret was just couldn't be asked. We then had been placed on the bench of the sleigh by the gigantic horrendous green elf and then he'd shrunk back with his sack. <laughs> sack. Sorry. The elf had stood in front of us for a while staring and giggling in a sissing method then then as if called it disappeared in a ping and a small dot of light had passed back through the roof back to Santa back into the house that the sleigh sat on. I I don't suppose the sleigh really sat on it. It kind of floated a foot above it and seemed to move a little like a boat moored on a calm lake. I've already told you I was naked. Go listen to the other episodes. This would make sense. I, I was naked, but... And it was a fucking big but. Some cunt had put a Santa hat on my head. I couldn't do anything about it. About the fucking red velvet thing with its fur lining and the fur pom-pom on the end. This was a level of torture already that I did not need in my life. Especially as the furry pom-pom at the end of the furry hat. It had been dangled, I imagined carefully, so that it sat on my left cheek in a, in a prime position of annoyance. From my interrogation training, I knew that this was a stress position of sorts. I mean, I was a physical specimen, so putting me in traditional stress positions would be pretty ineffectual. I can hold them for a few hours or more, so if you're in a rush, they're not the most effective manner of getting me to talk. I quite like stress positions, to be honest. Firstly, because I'm a massively kinky creature, and secondly, because I like to do a lot of yoga, so I put myself in stressful positions for fun. Torture to me is normally just, well, it's just kind of a training session. Or otherwise, well, I get off on it, to be honest. Either way, it's a win for me. In this case, with the hat, I did not know if this had been done on purpose or not, but the thing bouncing gently off my face and the fact that I was wearing a fucking Santa hat on my head was driving me utterly mental with incipient rage as I, I couldn't do anything about it. I have to say though, I wasn't cold. I don't know how that worked. It was not the snowy Christmas scene that you can imagine in your head. It was the usual British Christmas scene of dull, drizzle-filled cold darkness. It was, you know, the fine rain. You know, the type that Peter Kay tells us gets you wet right through. Yet, we were perfectly dry. The fine rain seemed to stop two feet above our heads and sizzle. The weirdest thing, I suppose, is that the sleigh and the deer were hanging in the sky, but below the runners and hooves was about a foot of crisp snow. Below the snow was, was well, thin air with nothing in it. See? Fuck the laws of thermodynamics. Magic, baby. It was a definite that whatever had happened and was happening, 
here especially, it was all magic and bollocks. What had ever sorted this out looked at the laws of physics and had gone, nah, fuck that. Let's just do this and ignore all the maths and shit. Don't blame it. As I was saying, the whole scene crackled with energy that circled around the sleigh, earthing here and there with tiny lightning strikes. The night was full of an electricity and it was, well, it kind of felt greasy as it ran over the skin. I could sort of see behind me a wee bit and could see the giant sack sitting in the back. It had toys poking out of its red self, as always. An old-fashioned wooden painted soldier. You know, the type you see in the books. Wooden and, and shit, not like an action man at all. With the shit wooden soldier were a candy cane all stripy and red and white and, and a teddy bear. You know, the bear looked more stein-like than a stein bear should. Hmm... Me, well, I was I was proper fuming at this point, proper fuming. And then two white dots floated up through the roof, and then with a ping of pinginess, they formed the elf and Santa with a flash. The elf sat down and pushed his way against me. Yuck. He stank. I mean, he proper stank. And he wiggled and wheedled his ass until he was comfortable and far too close to me. It... It looked like a gremlin crossed with a hairy gonk. It was terrifying, and its black balls, no, no, which were its eyes, showed absolutely no emotion. It was like it was like looking at a shark's eyes, you know, one of the dangerous ones, like a tiger shark. They just looked dead, and yeah. Then Santa himself swung up beside the elf. He was the image of Santa that you now see in your head. No, don't change it. I see what you're doing. It was the first one that sprang to mind. Yeah, that one. And he picked up the reins and said, ho, ho, away, Rudolph. And with the snapping of the leather straps, the reindeer leapt away down a tunnel of light to wherever the fuck we were going now. How are you two doing? The Santa asked over the noise of our journey through the dimensions. I'm really annoyed, was my reply. Fen just kept quiet. I knew that Santa and Prendor the Elf were in deep shit when Fen was silent. It's never a good sign for whatever is pissing him off. I, I knew he was thinking of some way to sort the shit out, which through a wealth of experience meant to me that he was mentally organising ultraviolence against these two. Ho, 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 said Santa. Not a laugh, he just spoke the hose. Can I, uh, can I ask what you are going to do with us? We are currently moving through the past where I'm going to show you a beautiful Christmas that you've had. A beautiful Christmas from your past and show you why they are of value to you, he told me. I was I was going to argue that we could not be currently travelling through time, but I soon realised that I had no idea what was going on and had no understanding of the current or past or anything else, so being Billy Big Balls and saying the current is a representative time frame would sound fucking ridiculous to someone who just knew it as magic. So, we're in a trans-dimensional portal that can take us through time, I asked him. There was a long silence. I could just see enough of Santa to see him furrow his brow as he thought about what I'd just said. The awkward silence extended and then was punctuated by Prendo, who slapped me across the face with some force and said, Magic's tunnels! Mm -hmm. With the slap, I could somehow now move my jaw a lot easier. Hmm, strange. I wanted to rub it, but I still couldn't move my hands to do that, so I satisfied myself by moving my jaw around a bit more. That slap would be held in my memory. It would be noted down. And the elf would have just earned himself at least another five or maybe ten minutes of continued agony in his life before he was killed. Mm -hmm. I smiled and laughed as though it didn't hurt. You do realise there are no S's in magic, don't you, you little fuck? I said to Prendo the elf. It laughed in response, obviously not getting my you know, clever quip, and pulled its hand back for another strike, and I prepared myself for the slap. No, Prendo, spoke the big man, and the elf dropped his hand to his lap with a snarl. Forgive Prendo, I am afraid he is a good elf, but a little old-fashioned in his manners. I did initially feel that I 
forgiven the little creature, but then I realised that it was Santa's glamour thing that made me feel like that, and I would never ever forgive this little cunt in reality. I lived to restore the harmony of my universe through the vitriolic torture and murder of those who've tried to hurt me. He was going to die horribly. So horribly. <laughs> it made me smile. I was able to have some level of control over Nick's glamour now. Smiling, moving, Hmm, time will tell as I could slowly move just that little bit more and that little bit more. We suddenly came to the end of the um, magic fucking tunnel and burst out of the flashing star effect into a cold night above a housing estate that was covered in a light sprinkling of snow. I guess this must have been in the past as I saw the older type cars parked in the drives of the middle class homes that littered the landscape. Oh, oh, we were back at my first home. We landed on the middle-class detached home that had been my house as a young child. There was my dad's red Ford Cortina in the drive, and I, I recognised it. Huh. As the sleigh came to a stop, I started to recognise the lie of the land and started doing one of those things that I fucking hate. Reminiscing. <sighs> Reminiscing about your childhood. I hate nostalgia and didn't want to catch it. You always seem to remember times with a sweet tendency when at the actual time it had been fucking shit. The next moment we were in the dining room of the house. It was crowded with my family and everyone was sitting at the table that was piled really high, really high with food. Christmas hats were being worn and my alcoholic parents were already pissed out of their minds at 3 p.m. Alcohol was just not for Christmas, though. Remember that, kids. Alcohol's not just for Christmas. It's for life. I was the child in the plastic high chair where my grandfather was feeding me a mashed roast potato and gravy as I gurgled. I could see another fen, another fen, lying down like a sleeping dog in the corner. He was just chilling. While another fen, my fen, is it my fen? Well, this fen, from my t I don't know, it was a fen, was watching what was happening. So there was a fen laying down and a fen watching the fen that was... It was confusing, it was weird seeing the two of them, but I got it, it was all magic and bollocks. There was much merriment and slurred chat at the table, and in the background was some kind of fucking shitty Christmas music. Santa stood next to me, smiled and nodded as I gurgled and burbled as Grandad fed me most entertainingly. Aeroplanes of food were being landed into my two-toothed mouth. See how happy you are, Santa said. Everyone is content and sharing a lovely time. See how family is so important. Eh? I looked at him. The, then at my granddad. He'd fed me using a plastic spoon and most of it had missed my mouth and ended up on my chin as I had flinched as a baby. <laughs> granddad held the spoon where it was so that the mushy food did not spill onto the high chair seat and he used a finger to scoop the food towards my mouth. See how much your family loves you, laughed Santa. You cannot say that they did not care and that you were not happy. Then my granddad started screaming. <laughs> <laughs> the next moment he was holding his hand as blood poured from a finger, well, what had been a finger, all over his legs and onto the tablecloth. Santa went quiet <laughs> and turned to see what had happened. Oh, good gracious me, he stammered. Little me <laughs> waited until the finger had got a little too close to the two new sharp teeth that I had now. Babyish me had laid a little trap for fucking grandad who, as a smoker, had made me suffer his stink and lousy breath while feeding me with those dirty, manky fingers. I'd bitten deep into the finger and managed to bite it off. I was now chewing the nub of my finger as quickly as I could before someone stopped me. There was screaming and yelling going on as people realised what had happened. They were confused and they were too late for them to stop me from being able to swallow the body part that I'd taken. It was gone. <laughs> I'm going to stitch that. 
Mum and Dad were now standing and freaking out as they moved towards Grandad and tried to stop the bleeding with a white cotton serviette that turned as red as it soaked up the blood from the injury. I, in my high chair, was a little giggling ball of fun as the blood dripped from my little ickle chin. My brother was crying and Mum was applying pressure to stop the bleeding. Six pairs of horror-filled eyes looked at the two-year-old child. Santa, Mum, Dad, Brother and Gran and Grandad. They all stood or sat in horror-filled silence for a moment. The Fenrirs, myself and, strangely, Prendo <laughs> seemed to love it. Prendo was jumping from foot to foot with a hand over the rip in his head which was his mouth trying to stifle his joy at the scene. Santa was still stunned. He removed his hat from his head, but did not remove his eyes from the... <laughs> Should we class it as an accident? Um, um. He was stumbling over his words. Um, that was unexpected, he said with every ounce of disappointment a man could purvey in his voice. Um, um. You are so right. That was one of the best Christmases I can remember, I told him. I faked a sniff as though trying to stop the nostalgic tears whilst brushing them away from my eyes. Oh, uh, that was not what I expected to happen as a happy Christmas moment, Santa told me. His face was a, a sight of horror and oh, how that face could express it. It was my... It was my first happy Christmas. I remember it well and <laughs> do you know what happened? I almost forgot. Two years later, Grandad died during Christmas dinner. He had somehow choked on a small plastic frog that had been in 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 one of those crackers that year. You know, no one knows. Nobody knows how it got into his throat, but it did. And he died. <laughs> Sweet memories. He fell dead in his, into his stuffing. Fuck, it was funny. Thanks for that. Santa shook his head ruefully. This was not the lesson I was trying to teach, he said. Well, to be honest, you did show me how much the Christmas of the past had been fun me, you know, fun for me. So, in a way, you've done a wonderful job. I told him gratefully. But you bit your grandfather's finger off during it. I know. Brilliant. Fen and I started laughing before suddenly we were sat back on the sleigh bench and in, in the early phases of takeoff, the elf beside me sat staring. Sat staring with those beady black eyes at me now. His um, face was unreadable, but he just sat and stared. We took off into the night and went back into the pan-dimensional wormhole of magical bollocks on another journey into time, he thinks. Still not sure, but at this point, I didn't really fucking care. I, that was brilliant. We landed on a wet street in central Manchester. It was dark and the streetlights blinked in the night. I recognised the spot. It was a site somewhere near Levensview, a place that was a police no-go zone and a site of drug use and prostitution, but not the drug use and prostitution you get at the top ranks of richness and nobility. This was the shit low-level hell of the fentanyl fan. This was the bastion of addiction and the death of the poor. <laughs> Father Christmas really knows where a good wolf would like to go. <laughs> this was everything I ever wanted for Christmas. <laughs> The Christmas sleigh drew up and we stopped. Father Christmas looked, well, he looked a little stunned at where we were. He was concerned and worriedly looked around under the flyer over the bridge where humans at the lowest depths of humanity lived. No, no, lived life. These people it was very wrong. These people were not living. This was not life. This was misery. The home of the addicted and lost. Those that did not fit into society, those of the uncared for mental health issues, the pain, the pain removal of narcotics and the no look in life that had brought these humans to this. Just this, so beautiful. This, oh, sorry, I'm strolling. 
That's so beautiful. This was an example of the worst of humanity, that they let these people live like this. And, and what made my Christmas was that this was a, a local example. And yes, we, we can be so proud of it. This is no third world country run by puppet governments for their natural resources to be removed and pumped out to the first world. Oh no, no, this was central Manchester, just five miles away from that once beautiful home of that family that I just murdered. This proudly, sorry, this proudly was our poverty and our destitution. As Santa stepped out of the sleigh, he stood in a big shit. Oh my goodness, this is disgusting, he cried out. Oh, <laughs> mate, mate, Santa, yeah, yeah, that ain't dog shit on your shoe, believe me, I can tell. This nose, this nose here, doesn't tell any lies, that's a hundred percent Mancunian human feces. With that step... I welcome you to Meanchester. One small step for mankind, literally into mankind's life. Shit. Gosh, I'm hilarious. Somehow I moved my hand up to the side of my nose. Ah, the glamour was fading. Awesome. Father Crimbo was losing control over me. The little elf thing noticed me move my hand and backed off a little bit backed off a little bit, smiling at me and laughing, a little hissing tee hee hee. He winked and turned and pointed at Santa then back at me. I winked back and pretended I had a clue about what the fuck he was trying to insinuate. He wants you to fuck up Santa's life a little, Will, came into my head from Fen. He could turn his head towards mine now. <laughs> Brendo is an evil little fuck that has been forced to be good, you know, do good stuff by Santa's glamour himself. So he comes, he, he, he hopes you give old Santa a run for his money, Fen continued. The elf checked on Santa, who was focused on wiping the shit from his shoe, and then looked back at me and nodded and gave me a thumbs up, a long, spindly, hairy thumbs up. Well, <laughs> this was getting much more interesting, much more fun. This is disgusting, was being repeated as Santa wiped the shit from his shoe. Suddenly, out of the drizzle-laden darkness came a woman. She'd, she had been a woman, but a hard life had done things to her. She was not entirely with us and staggered up the street. She wore tight jeans and uh, that were, well, were filthy and dirty around the knees and white scuffed high heels, no... No clothing for the weather. She had a thin bomber jacket over a thin cotton vest, yet she didn't seem to notice the cold as she was, well, not in the same frame of reference as us. She was fucking wasted on a drug of, well, we don't know a drug of her choice or who knew what or how many types. Maybe the fact she was walking was fucking unbelievable. I turned to watch this beautiful angel image as a tear developed honestly in my eyes. Hey, beauty is your own choice. It's in the eye of the beholder, right? As she got closer, we saw that she had her hair bundled up in a tight ponytail on her head, which was bound with a bit of, <laughs> a bit of shitty tinsel. Her bomber jacket was also silver and, and two sizes too big for her, and her eyes were... <sighs> sunken in a face that had lived several lives in the short time that she'd been on earth. It was it was a fleshless skull of a face, a face that told of a need more for drugs than food. This was a... This was a Christmas victim. Santa noticed her and announced himself with a ho, ho, ho. God, I hate that. She was blind to the world. She was blind to reality, never mind unreality. And he was confused as she made no response of any type. Ho, ho, he repeated. She stopped and looked up at him through what were, well, already dead eyes. She was a dry-skinned zombie, a dead woman walking. She looked 50 and a badly looked after 50, but I bet, I bet, I'm not sure, but I bet she was in her late 20s. Hey, mate, hey, mate, can you order me a taxi, mate? I need to get home to be kids. But I ain't got no money, she asked Santa. Perfect, 
<laughs> she was fucked up and, and she had kids. Perfect. Make this a happy one, Santa, you twat. Santa Claus was a bit nonplussed that she had not noticed that he was, well, that he was, well, Santa Claus. And he paused for a moment, scratching at his head as he thought, Um, I, I don't know how to order you a taxi, my dear, he told her. All right, all right, she said. You ain't got no phone then, have you? She tutted. Okay, mate, okay. What if I let you play with my tits? Will that help you find your phone? In fact, if you pay for the taxi, I'll let you finger me minge, she told old, confused Santa. He stood, open mouth, and looked at the woman. No, my dear, I am Santa Claus. I can make your Christmas wishes come true. I can make anything that you want and is reasonable, of course, because you've been a good girl, come true, he told her. The woman just stared at him with those dead zombie eyes. The silence rolled in. The awkwardness grew. Look, mate, just just ask me if you want to fuck me. It will cost you 50, she told him. Santa turned to me with some kind of pleading look in his eyes. He was, he was silently asking me for help. And then the, the woman just started walking again. As she left, she finished the conversation. Fuck you a very Merry Christmas, mate, she said as she signalled her single-fingered salute over her shoulder without looking back. Fern and I were pissing ourselves at the confused St. Nick. He had no idea what to do in that moment. He kept looking at me and then acting as if he was going to call her back. But by the time he got control over his level of flusterization, she disappeared into the cold, wet Manchester night. This was beautiful. Silence fell on our little group. A Saint Nick stared after the woman. He looked confused. His eyebrows were so knotted on his forehead with the relevant look of confustication that I felt a little bit sorry for him. It's all right, Saint Nick. Santa, can I call you Santa? Or is it Mr. Claus? Some people just don't get Christmas. <laughs> I told him. These people here. These people are used to being abused. They're used, they're used to being used and, and cannot accept human kindness or, <laughs> what do you call you, unhuman kindness because in their little awful world, kindness never comes without a price. I told this to the crest fallen demigod. He was staring down at the fecal matter he'd scraped from his boot onto the sleigh. Silently, and sheepishly, he looked at me. Merry Christmas, I said, holding my thumbs up to him. We were back on our way now into the night sky. Santa was not so fucking jolly now. He sat talking to himself as he went through the night. This was not how this was supposed to go. I don't think he realised how much I was enjoying this spirit of Christmas. This reality bite, the step away from the adverts into life's realities, the fact that Christmas for a lot was a miserable fucking time of the year, how little eight-year-old Bradley would not be opening any gifts this year because he was looking after his ill, junky mum and pretending that life was going okay to the world, just so he wasn't taken off her, who would look after her then? That John, the father of two, who lost his job a month ago, is so deep in debt and depression, but making out that the world, that all, that the world is okay, and, and all that he dreamed of, and really all he's dreaming of is escape by the noose and the door. And he's slowly realizing it might be the only way to solve his problem. Oh, never mind that. What about those poor kids starving in Ethiopia on the news? You know the ones, the ones with the flies landing on their eyes and the pot bellies through malnutrition. Hey Santa, you say that that was the 80s, but I know it's happening somewhere. You know, somewhere that's happening. And there's, 
you know, child trafficking and abuse and all that kind of stuff. Happy fucking Christmas, Santa! Again, we flew into the tunnel of magic, sparkly time warps. The four of us were a little more morose now. Not a single ho, ho, fucking ho had passed St. Nick's mouth for a while and he seemed ultra-quiet and ultra-focused on the night before him. We came back to the very first point we left. We were atop the middle-class house of the family that I had a middle-class murdered a few hours before. The sleigh stopped and all was silent apart from the sniffs, burps and farts of the reindeer. The elf next to me was vibrating with excitement. He seemed the happiest wee beastie on the planet as he turned his gaze to Santa. Um, why are we not going to see Christmas in the future, I asked him. He didn't say anything. He just stared at the floor of the sleigh. His head and posture were that of a beaten man. I smiled at him. Should we just get off here, then, I asked. He didn't look up. He just nodded his head and a tear dripped from his father Christmas nose. The elf who was now excited shook my hand and patted Fenrir. The first time ever I'd seen anything touch Fenrir and it helped us from the sleigh to the roof. We stood and watched as Santa picked up the reins and cracked them over the back of his reindeer. The sleigh shut off and all I remember of this is the little elf waving goodbye before it disappeared into a white dot of light that became one of the stars of the firmament. Fen and I were now sitting on the solar panels of the home's roof. We looked at each other and smiled. Well, I smiled. The wolf sort of smiled. Never mind, it's kind of difficult. It's hard to explain how a wolf smiles. Just remember, there's no wagging of tails. Definitely no fucking wagging of tails. Big, strong wolves don't do that, do they? Congratulations, Will. I think you fucked up Father Christmas, Fenrir said. I carefully bowed my thanks. I thought about the night and I smiled. I'd spoiled Santa Claus. I could not have killed him, but I could fuck up his mental attitude. It's probably better. An unreal being had been shown a, a little of the world's reality. I laughed. Fen and I finally combined into the werewolf and stood on the roof. I, because I'm petty, well, because I'm a twat, stamped and broke each and every solar panel on the roof. I know, I'm a proper dick. Once I'd fucked up everything enough, we leapt from the top of the building and we hit a fucking trampoline and I became an airborne werewolf. Fucking hate trampolines. That's the end of the episode. Please come and join us on Facebook. Please go and look at the description and there's loads of links down there that you can follow to do different things. Um, if you would... Um, subscribe to the podcast that would be fantastic if you would um, what's it called review it and give it stars and things that would be fantastic as well um, as always I hope that your new year is a wonderful thing for you and um, yeah I love you bye